Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. Russell, it is a pleasure to have you back on the show. I pulled you out of your uh, research for your new book to come back to an older topic, a much more uh, controversial subject. Or is it more controversial? They're both kind of controversial. Yeah, thanks for having me back, Robbie. Yeah, they are both controversial. Um, the, the war crimes trials, certainly controversial in, in several ways, really. But uh, the main way being, was justice really served? Um the people I'm looking at were certainly walking the streets. Those that weren't uh, executed were walking the streets within a few years of uh, being convicted of maybe murdering 150 people, maybe more. Both are controversial and both are extremely popular when it comes to the world knows them. Like the Belson trials, Newberg, all those things, everyone knows about it. Every country should know about it. But then you talk about the JFK subject. Well, every country knows about that as well, too. And there's just so much about it that fascinates people. But one thing I noticed was a consensus across the board, whether it's conspiracy or whether you believe it was a lone nut, was that it is the most botched autopsy of any autopsy that could possibly be performed, in, at least in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a very good point. It and I've looked at other autopsy reports, and I've spent time with uh, Cyril Wecht and, and other um, other forensic pathologists in the States and, and over here in the UK, and um, they all agree that it's the worst one they've ever seen, which is remarkable, isn't it? Because you would have expected it to be the best one they'd ever seen. Um, I mean, it's the equivalent of having our, our king assassinated. And and giving him the worst autopsy that anybody's ever read. It's just, it just seems very very unlikely. Um, but there were good reasons for it. I'm going to hit you with a hard question right up front because you mentioned the guy's name, but Wecht. Why was the Rockefeller Commission bar like didn't include his testimony or try to bury his testimony? I mean, can you explain that a little bit? Maybe a little bit about the Rockefeller Commission for people that are new and might not know too much about the Rockefeller Commission. I'll do my best. Yeah, I mean, the Rockefeller Commission was an investigation into the CIA um, interfering in domestic affairs, which it shouldn't have been. And one of the questions that, um, that the public wanted answered really was whether the CIA was involved in the JFK case. And so um, to try to show that the CIA could not possibly be involved, they um, the government wanted to show the shooting of um, all the shooting was done from behind by one person blamed on Lee Harvey Oswald. And so um, ostensibly they, they selected a panel of medical experts to look at the medical information. But that's not actually what happened when I, when I looked at it closely. What actually happened was they were given all the information, but they really just looked at the Zapruder film. And if you read the Rockefeller Commission report on that part of, um, of the of the medical evidence it, it's all about the doctor's opinions on the Zapruder film and um, they did include some they, they talked to uh John Latimer and of course he's a, a famous Professor Latimer he's a famous um, pro lone nut and so uh, to balance that they they also uh, interviewed Wecht but of course they then misrepresented what he said um, and uh, Dr. Wecht was extremely upset about it. He still is. When it comes to the multiple investigations, how did you come across the Rockefeller Commission as being one that investigated the president's death? Did you just type it in on Google and come across, or did you come across some documents that they had? That because oh, yeah. you can look at any. There's, I mean, there's so many documents out there about the JFK case that there's so many investigations. I'm sure there's probably plenty out there that we just haven't heard of yet. But what I did was I tried to really narrow down what I was going to investigate, because, uh, as you said before, it's a huge subject and um, you can't do a huge subject uh, justice by um, looking at it. Well, I mean, some people take that broad view and try to do and try to write something which has a broad aspect of the assassination. Um, but if you want to look at any specific evidence like um the forensics evidence or the ballistics evidence or um, the evidence of photography, you've really got to narrow it down. Uh, and even within those areas, you have to narrow it down further. And so that's what I did. I, I, what I wanted to do is look at the investigations, the different 
investigations into the medical evidence because over the years what the US government has done is try to show that the autopsy was done correctly and the evidence they found at the autopsy was true that they they only found evidence for shooting from behind by one person and and so over the years what they've done to convince the US people is they've reviewed that evidence and to do that they've set up panels of doctors to do that um and they've really only done it um three times and each time was was fairly botched um, and that's what my book jfk medical evidence that's what it's about it's about the three investigations the clark panel the rockefeller panel and the hsca um, doctors panel um and so it, once you decide to narrow it down like that then of course you start to look through the books you've read i mean i've been into the case for well, it's, it's getting on for 40 years now um so i have a, a wide library i have a lot of books and i just started to look in the books to find out who which investigations were made and then who was on those panels um, and then the next step for me a logical step for me was to find out well why did those panels all, all come to the same conclusion that the autopsy evidence was sound when it's obvious to anybody who looks at it um that it isn't well it's a key point you highlight in your book is that you talk about the disagreement on the magic bullet theory uh, which then you go into Arlen Specter and his creation of that. But I, a lot of people don't know about the disagreement on the magic bullet theory. They start thinking, well, it's remembered as the magic bullet and everything like this. So then all these pathologists and doctors had to agree on it, right? For there to be this overall arching theory of how this one bullet can make eight different wounds into two sep two people. So I'm curious, what did you find about the disagreements on the magic bullet theory? Well, I there weren't many disagreements in in the panels i looked at uh, and and i wondered why um but I, I think the real reason that there weren't many disagreements with this the lone bullet theory is because if you dismiss that theory if that's not true then there was more than one shooter then you really have to get into it right so um you dismiss the single bullet theory and, and in my opinion the best way is to look at each of the individual wounds which um, the autopsy and the government over the years has said were caused by this one bullet. So you start with the entrance wound on JFK's back. And just by saying it's a back wound means that the whole theory won't work because if the bullet goes into the back, it can't come out the center of the throat when it's coming down at an angle from the uh, Texas School Book Depository. And it was a back wound. It, it went into his um well near to his thoracic vertebrae which is higher in in the back and not his cervical vertebrae which are in the neck it definitely was down in the back and so if it was definitely down in the back it couldn't have come out, out of the throat so even the first point of the single bullet theory is dismissible and it and it's easily dismissible because who moved who who moved that wound up from the back to the neck good old gerald ford the same person that was hoping the rockefellers report would never reach the light of day right you got it you got it so even he realized that he had to move that wound up otherwise it didn't work what about when we talk about the statement from Connolly? there are some doctors that looked at the statement of Connolly and agreed that there was a separate bullet didn't really go with the magic bullet, but there was two shots being fired and they were hit like one hit Connolly and one hit JFK, which is what Connolly always stated that he wasn't hit with the same bullet that uh, hit JFK. He did, but um, yeah, I think Connolly is, is a tough area. You really have to get into the medical evidence there. I mean, it, it's possible that it was one bullet. Let me say it's possible that the bullet went through his chest and then went through his wrist and into his thigh. But it's improbable. And, and particularly when you look at the evidence, it's, it's improbable because the only way you can actually make the single bullet theory work is to have JFK um, sitting in a certain position and Connolly sitting in a certain position in front of him, which is a bit, it's a bit of an unnatural pose for them. And certainly none of the photographs show that they, they sat in that way. Um, th there is more evidence. I mean, there, uh, there's not forensic evidence because, of course, he didn't die. 
the, the evidence for Connolly comes from the surgeons and the surgeons made detailed notes of what they did um, to, to clean up the wounds and to take out any bullet fragments. And I, I think one of the, the major problems with it is there, there are just too many fragments left in Connolly that they couldn't have all come from one bullet. And I've tried to make this case a couple of times in several presentations. The problem is we don't know the weights of the fragments. We only we get uh, pictures of the sizes of them, but we don't know the weights. And so we can't say definitively that it didn't come from one bullet, but they probably didn't. What about not no tests being done on trajectory analysis when it came to how this because you go into it a little bit into your book, which I think is important because a lot of people usually can get and we're going to get to Parkland, of course, and then maybe a little bit of Bethesda. But a lot of people get stuck at those areas because that's where there's probably very, very clear testimony before you see some serious government um, shenanigans going on. Yes, but there's never been any proper serious trajectory testing um that goes through both of the both the um jfk and the governor i mean the whole point of the trajectory testing is to show that the single bullet theory works but it has so many problems that nobody can actually make it work um they just they just can't line up those two people at that distance with that type of weapon sh firing that kind of projectile and have it go through the two people in the way that they claimed it did. Well, if Kennedy was sitting on like the back seat, like the actual back of the car and sitting up like how if he's waving to people, then that could be possible because you could have it go from a downward angle into Kennedy and then go straight into Connolly if Connolly's directly in front and Kennedy's just higher up. But they're sitting at the exact same level. So that means that bullet would either have to bounce off his spine or do some type of weird maneuver, which just seems highly improbable to come out perfectly pristine after all that damage would be done. Actually, probably they weren't at the same level, to be fair. Um, Connolly was sitting slightly lower in the car okay. than JFK, and he was about six inches inboard of JFK. So um, the trajectory works a little bit better with having him lower and more inboard of the car. Um, but the problem is it all starts at that first wound. If it didn't go into JFK's neck, it couldn't have come out of his throat. Period. Why do and you think go into his neck? Why, yeah, why do they? Why do you think they brought in Arlen Specter? Um, I'm not. I um, yeah, it's a it's a good question. I mean, it obviously, was on the government side right from the right from the start. Um, he was a young junior lawyer, and he, they didn't have to pay him so much. That that's the bottom line, really. It was none of those. I mean, certainly the the commissioners, they they didn't turn up every day to do work for the Warren Commission. The senior lawyers, they didn't turn up every day either. They gave all the grunt work to the junior lawyers who could afford to take the low rate of pay that they were being offered because it was similar to what they would be offered anyway. But you would think in a situation like that, you'd want someone with a lot of credits to you to be able to just give a good definitive conclusion of like, well, he said it, so it's got to be like having Earl Warren on the uh, Warren Commissioner, head of the Warren Commission. It's a lot of credits to that man. Yeah, right. I mean, if you did it again, you you try to choose um, either a lawyer who had that kind of experience with gunshot wounds and um, a medical testimony. You try to pick the lawyer who'd done that. I mean, Arnold Spector comes across as not knowing anything about either of those two things. Or you'd have um, somebody who could assist him and advise him on those aspects of the law and those aspects of medicine that he was ignorant of. I mean, that they didn't do that. It seems like throughout all the medical investigations, there was not a lack of experience, but a lack of important experience. Like if you're having pathologists that have never or haven't performed an autopsy in however many years or don't focus specifically on gunshot wounds, they focus on other things, which you also detail in your book as well, too. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's not it, the, the panels that they formed were not about who's got the right experience. It's about who has got the right connections and can be controlled, in my, in my opinion. And I think I show that to a degree in the book. Who do you show is the most susceptible, like if we talk about the Parkland doctors? Oh, well, um, the Parkland doctors, really, it was the 
it was Humes and, and Boswell, because Humes led the team. Boswell was his assist his assistant, a senior guy. Um and then of course Fink comes too late in the autopsy to do anything meaningful with his expertise, which wasn't very great either. And all of them are military. And so it's it's fairly easy to to order military people to have a certain point of view or to write certain things or to not reveal other things. And you can threaten them in many ways. I mean, just um, disobeying an order is threat enough. But if you're the director of the laboratories at Bethesda Hospital, you want to keep that position. It's a very prestigious opinion, uh, uh, position and you've reached it by hard work. And your colleagues think you're, you know, you're a pretty pretty um, smart guy. So you want to maintain that position. You don't want to be demoted. And then finally, you've got your pension to think of. You've been in the Navy. It's a career. They were all career people in the Navy and the Army. You've got a pretty hefty pension behind you. It's gold plated. Um, and uh, when they retired, I mean, you've only got to look, look at the pictures of them when they retired, sitting in their gardens and playing golf every day. It's that's what paid for it. Who do you think was somehow in on the cover up or just some fraudulent things with the autopsy? I mean, I think everyone points to Humes because he burned his, um, I think his preliminary draft of his autopsy notes and, and his fireplace was the excuse that he gave, which ended up coming out later, not originally when the Warren Commission talked to him. It came out in the HSCA's investigation. Um, but who do you think was the most suspicious out of that? Because I think, if I'm not mistaken, Humes talked about it, the neck wound being an entrance wound. I could be could be confused on that one. Uh, it, it, the neck wound in the throat or in the in the back of the in neck? In the throat. In the throat. Um, well, he didn't really know what it was because he missed it. He didn't see it in the autopsy. Okay. Um, if you remember, he he saw a thoracotomy incision, uh, which was made by the um, emergency surgeons at Parkland. He, he didn't see a bullet wound at all. And he only described it as a bullet wound when he, he phoned up Parkland and, and they said to him, well, did you see the hole in the throat? And it was a moment I, I missed that. And the body had gone. So he, he didn't examine it. And he just guessed. He guessed that it must have been an exit wound for the entry he had in the back. And the reason that he did all of this was because he was told all the shooting was from behind. We don't want you to find anything else. So whatever you find, just make sure that your report says that the entrance wounds are all in the back and the exit wounds are all in the front. So come, that's what he did. How come Berkeley didn't do anything? I mean, he was present at both autopsies and it seemed like he was not interfering at all. Million dollar question. Um, and, he, and he should have done, of course. He he knew because, as you say, he was, he was present both in Dallas and in Washington. Um, he was a career guy. He was an admiral, wasn't he? So um, I think at one point maybe he wanted to say something. There's certainly some evidence that he wanted to tell the HSCA the, the truth as he saw it, but he, he never did. Um, so either he was coerced or, or threatened or he... In some way or another, he thought better of it. It's a, that's a mystery. Did you ever see with the JFK movie, they have a character that kind of represents like Curtis LeMay, allegedly being at Bethesda telling people, hey, don't touch that, don't do this. Did you find anything that shows evidence to support that or whoever that figure is? Maybe it was speculation about who it was, but there was a person, if I'm not mistaken, that was directing the autopsy. Yeah, I, I think... I don't know what the evidence is. The Secret Service certainly made a list, or the FBI made a list of who was in the autopsy room in um, Bethesda that night. Um, and of course, they may have missed certain people off. If Curtis LeMay had said to them, don't put my name in there, I'm sure they wouldn't have done. Uh, so I, I don't know. There, There is some evidence that um, Humes had a, a disagreement with somebody and told them to stop smoking cigars, which, of course, famously Curtis LeMay did. But I don't really know whether he was there or not. It wouldn't surprise me. Are, do you know what happened or do you have any speculation about what happened to Pierre Fink's notes? He talked about taking notes and he said that his notes went missing. And apparently from an encounter in a lunchroom, he voiced to some people his frustration that someone must have swiped his notes. And I think 
I would point at Humes because he already has a record already of destroying important information. I mean, we're just taking him at his word of that's all he destroyed. And that took years to come out. It didn't come out originally in the first investigation or questioning of him. So I'm curious if Pierre Fink's notes were swiped by Humes and then he just destroyed those. Well, they were certainly taken by Humes, yeah, because as the lead uh, autopsy surgeon, he he was down to write the he was going to write the report, so he took both um, Boswell's notes and Fink's notes, and both of those doctors expect to get their notes back, but of course um, he burnt them. Yeah, I'm sure he burnt Fink's as well. Fink was very annoyed about it. Who did the most important work on trying to reveal what was going on during the autopsy? I mean, you do talk about the HSCA, which is largely kind of neglected by the research community just based on, I don't know why people hate it. I guess it didn't hit the right conclusion they wanted. But there's a lot of good questioning that was brought out. And then even later when the Assassination Records Review Board was going through documentation, they were able to find some important information on the medical evidence. Yeah, they, they, were, all, they were all pretty good. But I, I think... Um, I mean, there's there's information there that you can find. It, and in the end, you find that their report doesn't actually support what they saw. Um, because I, I suppose they didn't really expect people to dig too hard into that information. Um, certainly, no. as far as I'm aware, nobody has seen any first drafts of the HSCA report. And I've got all of the drafts, the first drafts. There were seven. Um, and I, I, that's part of the uniqueness of my book that I talk about those first drafts and how they were changed to support the government position. But I think if you want to know details of the autopsy, you have to look at some private researchers. And even if you don't agree with their conclusions, there have been some really good ones. David Lifton um, did everybody a service by um, looking closely at the autopsy evidence, even if you don't agree with his body alteration theories. And then, of course, Doug Horn picked those up later on. And Doug Horn, who worked for the um, Assassination Records Review Board, he did a, a lot of good work on finding new information and um, publishing the interviews that the AARP made with the, the various medical um, witnesses. So you've got to look at those two private authors, really. You, you don't have to agree with their, their conclusions, but their, their evidence is there. What about, could you maybe give a background on Carrico and Hinchcliffe and their importance when it comes to looking at the medical evidence? Yeah, sure. Um, um, Carrico was a, um, he was an emergency surgeon. He's the first one that saw JFK when he was lifted onto the stretcher at Parkland, along with um, Nurse Hinchcliffe, and they wheeled him into the room. So while they're doing that, they're making observations. They're trying to figure out where they need, what they need to do first. And of course, what they needed to do first was secure his airway, which means getting a breathing tube into him so that they can um, help him, assist him with his respiration. And so they were making a very close look at the small hole in JFK's throat um, to, to see what damage had been done and whether they could get a tube, um, an endoscopic tube down his, down his throat into his trachea past that wound so that they could control the breathing. Uh, and they they did that. They they what we call intubated him. Uh, but it wasn't, of course, until Perry turned up and and he conferred with Carrico and said, you know, do you do you think this is really sealing off properly and we've got proper control of this? And they agreed that they hadn't, that they decided to do the tracheostomy so that they could put a tube directly into the the bullet wound just happened to be at the right place for yeah. a, a tracheostomy incision. Um, so um, Carrico's observations are extremely important because he saw um, JFK first while he was alive before any of his wounds had been um, tended to. So he was able to get the best first view of those in Hinchcliffe, of course, and to some degree Perry. What about the statements of other doctors that saw JFK and talked about a massive hole in the back of his head? Um, it seems like they're... They have statements in the Warren Commission, but it's not as clear cut. You kind of have to keep reading and then look at different lines to be able to get the full thing out of it. And I started wondering if that was just 
maybe not so much of questioning, but an interrogation style that the Warren Commission was doing. It seemed like it included certain testimonies and left out certain testimonies. Yeah, I mean, I mean the whole problem with the, the Warren Commission, and it's been a problem all along, is really what they should have done is brought the Parkland doctors to Washington to give their evidence and been fair and shown them the the autopsy photographs. Um, and it would have been quite easy to say, well, th is this how it looked to you? Um, and it wasn't until years later that the that people started to get the Parkland doctors to actually mark on um, on drawings and on mannequin heads the the hole that they saw in Parkland, and and it was only very small. Well, I, I say very small. A hole in your head's a bad thing, right? Um, so any size is is not good. But it was the size of a large egg, shall we say, this kind of size at Parkland. And that's the way they described it. That's the way they drew it. And that's the way they marked the mannequins. But that's not what we see in the autopsy photographs, which are, are supposed to be authentic autopsy photographs. What we see is the entire back and right side of the of the head missing. Um, well, <laughs> I say that's what we see. In some photographs, you see damage at the back. In some, you see damage at the side. But in the drawings that the um, Bethesda doctors made, well, only one, actually, when Boswell drew his drawing, it was the whole top and right side and some of the back of the, the head. I mean, they described it as occipital, parietal, extending somewhat into the temporal area, which is here. But in, in Parkland, it was an occipital parietal wound, which is in the back, extending slightly higher in the head. So and then the whole problem is that they they didn't properly, properly depose those doctors in Washington, and they never did. The key fact for that is everyone would point to the uh, Harper fragment as being a perfect piece of bone that would fit in that area that everyone is describing. But there was more than just one fragment that was found, too. I didn't know this until Vince, when I spoke with Vince Palomaro about it, and he mentioned that on a plane um, on the way back, uh, I guess flying back to D.C. with the Lincoln Continental or something like that, that someone had found another fragment. He named the fragment the exact fragment, but then that just went missing from evidence that was never submitted. And there was a number of evidence of fragments that were in that bucket when they were picking it out at Parkland Hospital that was never submitted. There were lots, lots of fragments. And um, over the years, lots of people have tried to fit them into a diagram of the skull and to try and show whether the Harper fragment particularly was occipital or parietal or who knows. I mean, we only have we have a, a photograph that was taken a couple of days later at a hospital in Dallas, and we have the FBI photographs, then it then it went missing. And so we don't really know. We don't know where it fits in the skull. Not definitively. We don't know where any of the fragments fitted in. And there was certainly a um, an anthropologist, Dr. Angel, who tried to do that for the HSCA, tried to fit them into the skull. And it's if you read the testimony, it's totally confusing, and it's absolutely pointless, because nobody knows. What about C C1, the actual, the doctors not being able to identify C1 or not making a clear distinction if that's the bullet that they were able to identify as that's the bullet that was in JFK? Um, C399. I think C1 was the FBI. Uh, that's what the FBI called it, wasn't it? And C399 is what the yeah. Warren Commission called it. Um yeah, that, I mean, that is, that's very strange, isn't it? That's something that uh, um, some other investigators, including Tink Thompson, found out was that the people who were supposed to have found it um, said that the bullet looked nothing like the one in evidence um, and was pointed and um, not round-tipped and probably a different calibre. That That is weird. Um, and it's, it's, it's something that the government really needs to explain. Well, you know, show us... Show us the chain of possession. Show us the the marked and the signed envelopes of that bullet being picked up on the stretcher in uh, Parkland and being received by the F by the FBI. And they can't. Then, unless you can have a a proper chain of possession for a piece of evidence, 
then it can be questioned in court. Now, a lot of people think that that means it can be thrown out of court. It doesn't. It doesn't mean that at all. What it means is the judge or can instruct the jury to say, this piece of evidence doesn't have a proper chain of possession. Therefore, you must give it less weight than you would that did have a proper chain of evidence. They're not saying that it it's not the same bullet. They're saying that it's um, you can't be sure beyond reasonable doubt that it is. Does that make sense? Yeah. What about the, you mentioned this earlier, but about the autopsy photographs. Clearly, I think it's confusing for everyone if you watch the Zapruder film and then you look at the autopsy photographs and you go, wait, I, how is his head still even intact? You know, how do we have a, his, his face? It looks like that the whole right side would be gone, which is a, what a lot of people describe is that the whole right side of his head was gone. But this, you can come across varying photographs. I think everyone knows how horrifying they are with his face open like that. I mean, what are your thoughts on it? When it comes to, do you believe that there was manipulation pre-surgery to the head? Do you believe that they did something to it to make him look a certain way? My honest answer is I don't know. And the reason I don't know is because the evidence just doesn't match. And this is the problem that, that researchers are still having. And I discussed this when I was in Pittsburgh last November. There, there are um, broadly two teams of people. One that believes that the... Sapruda films, absolutely authentic. And they use that to go on and prove what they believe are, are other facts in the case. And another team of people who believe that, that it's it's easy to see that the Sapruda film has been changed. Now, I don't, I don't know which one to believe amongst those, but you're right. The Sapruda film doesn't match the autopsy evidence. The autopsy evidence doesn't match the Parkland evidence. None of it matches anything that anybody has investigated. So you've got these these pieces of evidence. If they don't match up, it's a very difficult puzzle to put together. So I, I don't try. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm sorry. I'm not an expert on films. I'm not an expert on photography. All I've tried to do is show that, you know, another piece of this puzzle is that teams of doctors have reviewed the medical evidence and they've not done it honestly. And so that, again, means that we, we cannot support other parts of the evidence with what the doctors have said. And it's a big shame because by now we should be able to be big boys about it and um, and start investigating it honestly. And you really break it down and you hit on a couple points when it comes to just looking at these military men with their careers um, and based on obviously a conclusion that already had a predetermined, was already predetermined and they kind of had to make it fit or they had to kind of agree with the line whether it was against their best interest of doing no harm um, as a, whether it's a medical expert or anything of that sort, they had a box to fit in and they realized the damage to their careers if they didn't do that. And you hit on that a, a couple of times in this episode as well too. But I think it's really important to stress to people because I don't think people view it like that. They kind of view it like people that are obviously given a job that they're not supposed to, they're supposed to look for truth especially in a government investigation. And that's not necessarily what happened. I mean, there's a lot of things that have not been explained. And that's why we don't know where Kennedy's brain is. You know, there's theories that Robert Kennedy took it. There's, from what I can tell, I don't know if they put it in that little box chest they talked about putting it in in the first place. Yeah. I have no idea what happened to the brain. No, nobody knows um, definitively what happened to it. But, but here's the here's the biggest problem, really, is that the two guys that did the autopsy were not forensic pathologists. So a forensic pathologist is always going to look at a wound on the body, um, particularly if it's a gunshot wound, and try to figure out, was this an entrance or an exit wound? And the way they try to figure it out is they look at the characteristics of the wound and they take samples of the edges of the wound to try to prove it was one or the other. And... The problem was that these the guys that did the autopsy didn't do that. They didn't look at trying to show whether something was an ex entrance or an exit. They just um, they just, just told, assumed what they'd been told was true that all the shooting had come from behind. So anything in the back was an entrance wound. There was no need to try and prove it, and anything in the front was an exit wound. No need to try and prove that either. So of course, they totally missed the the throat wound. So the only entrance wound and exit wound they had was on the head. And they should have been very carefully looking at that and photographing it, properly photographing it with um, at least I was a photograph from a, 
a distance and then a midpoint and then close up. None of that was done, or if it was done, we don't have the photographs. By the time the guy who could have actually approached the, the body in that way arrived at the autopsy, that was Fink, who was a qualified forensic pathologist, although he'd not had much experience. By the time he arrived, the body had been changed. The wounds had been altered. Nobody saw the wound in the front. The wound in the back, well, Humes had stuck his finger into it. So that had been changed. And they had already taken the brain out of the head, which means they must have re removed the top of the head to get the brain out. Well, that's completely destroyed uh, any evidence that, um, well, at, at least modified any evidence that um, Fink could have found. So there's the problem stems from having two guys who didn't know what, didn't really know what they were doing on a forensic autopsy, um, being told a certain story and coming up with evidence that matched that story. Another aspect you go into in your book is um, hopefully give a background on some of these figures, but uh, Joseph Dolce, um, and mm -hmm. I'm going to pronounce his last name wrong. I even wrote it down, but Frederick Height, I think his last name is. I'm probably mispronouncing that, but. Uh, these these are the guys that did the testing for the um, for the Arsenal Edward Arsenal, aren't they? Um, yeah. Um, well, I mean, the whole thing was was a setup, really. I think um, I I can't remember all the details. I can tell you that there were four four doctors involved, one of whom was a vet uh, veterinarian, um, an animal doctor, who did all of the all of the testing and all the writing up. Um, and the the four doctors involved should have all been um, questioned by the Warren Commission, but only three of them were. Uh, and the guy who dissented, Dolce, they didn't interview him at all. And over the years, he he was very well, he's quite vociferous about why he thought uh, the guys had got it wrong. And and the details of the testing, I mean, you can you can get the the test reports; they're available. I've I've got them, um, and you can get the test photographs. And it's pretty easy to prove that whatever testing they did was not uh, significant scientifically. They didn't; they just didn't do enough, um, and they probably didn't do the right testing either. Was Dolce the guy that was talking about shooting cadaver wrists and how the bullet would always come out deformed afterwards? Uh, he didn't actually do any of the shooting, I don't think. Um, but you're right; yeah, that that certainly happened at the the Edgewood Arsenal. I think there's an interview with him where he's talking about shooting cadaver wrists. Not him, maybe specifically, but he talked about that you can shoot a number of cadaver wrists and the bullet always comes out deformed, which is like the statement from one of the Parkland doctors who was in a History Channel documentary who talked about that there was a hole in the windshield that you could stick a pencil through. Yeah. And yeah. you're like, what's why? How come none of these people were like, you know, questioned a little bit harder on some of these aspects of things? And you mentioned another dissenter, but it's Wecht, back to Wecht again. Another dissenter who's been openly vocal, and you got to meet him. Um, um, you went to the conference he was at in Pittsburgh, right? So you got to see him. Was he there? Sure. Yeah, he was there. Um, yeah, I wish I could have went. It's a couple hours away from me. I didn't have the time for that one. But uh, that's someone that's living history, and it, their information and their fight for pursuing for justice that hasn't given up after 60 years going on 60 years. Yeah. Yeah, I met him several times over about 30 years, and... Um, he, I mean, he's frail now. Um, it was probably the last conference that um, Dr. Wecht is going to attend. Uh, he's in his 90s and he's quite frail, um, but he's still a super guy, you know, and he's he's extremely pleasant and he still speaks very well when he speaks on the case. Um, I mean, what he's what he remembers about the case is, is enormous and his, his books are worth reading, too. Um, but I think the best resource for, for Dr. Wecht is to go onto YouTube and look at some of the speeches he's made at conferences. Um, they're amazing. Once the guy, um, I saw him in, in Washington uh, in the 90s give a speech, and he's so impassioned about it, and he's so knowledgeable about it. Um, he's, uh, you know, it's, it's a shame that he's, he's not a younger guy and, and couldn't continue the work now. But the torch is being passed on to other people. And there's certainly other other medics coming along who are trying to pick that up. Uh, Gary Aguilar does a lot of work. Dr. Gary Aguilar, uh, Dr. Doug DeSales, he does a lot of work too. He's very much in the background. Um, 
uh, and there's other there are other medical people that are they're working hard to try and get the truth out there but it's not easy <laughs> it's not easy did you happen to see there was an interview with Boswell later or either Boswell or Humes? It was like in 72 or 76, but they were showing photographs of the head and everything intact. And one of the guys just asked him a question, why does his hair look wet here? And it was just like kind of one of those moments where it's like, hang on a second. That is a very good question. Yeah, you know, they pointed it out and they had it blown up in giant photographs showing it in the courtroom. And those guys didn't have an answer. No, well, I mean the, the the glib reply would be that there's those aren't the photographs that they took, or the photographs have been altered in some way. Um, kind of uh, like John they, Stringer talks about. Yeah, exactly. But they can't really say, can they? Because they've they've gone on record, they've given sworn testimony um, about those photographs in the past, um, so they they hardly want to have their. Um, going going back to court for perjury, um, and they certainly don't want their pensions. Or well, I, I think I believe they both passed away now. So, um, but of course they they've got family, or they may have widows who still rely on it. When it comes to left questions, maybe not so much about the specifics of what was altered and what was there, but did you ever wonder why there were a lot of weird testimonies that came out from the medical evidence? Like you got Cybert and O'Neill's testimonies and statements that really kind of conflict with just different times of where the body was at and when the body was at. But if you look at the overall autopsies, you have wide varying statements from many doctors that are all giving different descriptions where I was like, there's just one body. We all know it's just one body. How do you all have different opinions of what you can see and what you can't see? Yeah, and that, and that is the problem, isn't it? Because, like I said before, you know, the, the, the statements made by the Parkland do doctors don't match the statements made by the Bethesda doctors in, in any way, really. Um, so, that, uh, in my opinion, you have to go back to people who have got no, no bone, uh, no skin in the game, no axe to grind whichever way you want to say it. Um, you've got to go back to people who have got no reason to, to lie. And the, the Parkland doctors had no reason to lie. And you can read their, they call them admission notes, but the notes that they made immediately after JFK died on the table. And they had no reason to believe they were writing down was in any way going to be a politically, um, a political problem in any way. So they just wrote down what they saw. And I think they're the most honest descriptions. They're in the Warren Commission report, so you can read them there. And then I think that's somewhat true of Sibber O'Neill, who were the FBI agents. They had um, they'd not been told what the official story was. So they, I think what they wrote down was honest. Those, those are the ones I'd go with. Do you not find it suspicious that they didn't let Earl Rose look at the body or be able to handle the body like it was Texas law back then that uh, he had to do the autopsy if someone is killed or dies in Texas? Yeah, I did at one time. Um, and maybe I still do to a degree. Certainly he would have been the person that would have done the autopsy and legally should have done it because the, the body shouldn't have been removed from Dallas. Um, it's another point of that chain of possession that and it's the law, it was the law, probably still is, in, in Texas that a homicide victim has to be autopsied in the same, I think it was the same county, the Dallas County, that they, they were killed in. Um, but then I then you could look at it a different way and say, listen, you know, the, the president's just been killed. There's Nobody knows what's going on. There's certainly a a hint that there might be more people waiting to shoot other people in the government, because a lot of them were down there, of course. Um, and what we need to do is get home. We really need to get back on board that plane. And so I mean, the, certainly the, the reason that Johnson gives for taking the body was that Jackie wouldn't leave. She wouldn't leave without her hus husband's body. Um, and they certainly wanted to get Jackie away. Um, so they had to take the body with them. So I don't, I don't know whether I buy that entirely. Uh, I'd like, I'd like to to be able to go down one side or the other and say, well, you know, it was illegal. They never should have done it, 
and it stinks that they didn't allow the the proper um, autopsy forensic pathologist to do the work in Dallas um, because Rose was very experienced. I mean, he he'd done hundreds of gunshot wound um, autopsies, and I've looked through his records, which um, are amazing. I mean, he kept everything to do with the. He kept loads of things that you wouldn't imagine a person would keep, but. I mean, he also did the he did the autopsy on um, Lee Harvey Oswald, and he did the one on um, Ruby. And I've got from his collection, I've got slides of the Ruby autopsy. No, amazing stuff that that guy kept. Every time he saw something that mentioned the assassination in any way, he clipped it from the newspaper and kept it. His archive is huge. I wonder if he's a conspiracy theorist. I mean, he's unfortunately, he's, he's not alive now. He's dead. Um, he died I know, some, but some time ago. But... Hopefully before he died, he was a conspiracy guy. Oh, no, he wasn't. No, he's, he was totally, he was totally, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald did it. The government are 100% right. No, he was a total government man. Damn shame. Damn yeah, shame. Yeah, I, I agree. I would figure that if you're clipping everything about the assassination, something has to pique your interest of like. I think it's just because he was so heavily involved. It's a good credit on the resume, I guess. I guess, yeah. I mean, he certainly, he certainly kept being a senior person throughout his entire career. Uh, what about Carl Erdley? I think I might be saying his name wrong. Are we talking about the Clark panel? How that came into being? Did Boswell was Boswell told to create yeah. that? Yeah, I mean, he was. He well, yeah, and it wasn't. Well, Carl Carl Erdley might have been involved, but it was mainly uh, Ramsey Clark. He was involved with that. So the story of this is that um, Clark, out of the blue, received a letter from Boswell saying, hey, you know, I, there's a lot of questions about this. Why don't you just put another panel together to review the evidence? Um, I think that's a good idea. And so does um, Humes. Um, but then if you look closely at the letter, it, there's so many things wrong with it. it. It's not on headed paper for a start. And of course, someone of Boswell's seniority would definitely have had a headed paper. There's no references on it. And you don't write, you don't write a letter without some kind of reference on it that um, identifies the person who typed the letter, for instance, in those days, the person who typed it would have put their initials on it somewhere. And um, it's the wrong size paper. It's on government size paper rather than the sort of paper that they would have had in a hospital. Um, there are many things wrong with it. Um, I, talk about it in the book and i've i've given presentations on it i actually found another letter that boswell wrote it's contemporary he wrote it at the same time and i compared the two and that's how i noticed all these differences and the the point is that um boswell didn't write the letter at all the was, letter was written by the um, department of justice by clark's people um and he can't possibly have been surprised to to have received a letter addressed to himself from himself um so that the whole premise of the clark panel is a lie did it surprise you that when you're looking at all these that they all came out to be lies or did you look at it like how we've always looked at things in society where to get an answer or conclusion on something or closure there has to be a kind of a spectacle it's like the bread circus yeah i i don't know whether i was surprised that there were lies I was surprised at the amount of collusion, um, collusion between different people to come to the same government opinion uh, or government. What the government wanted to say was that you know, one person did all the shooting from behind. It was Lee Harvey Oswald with his crappy old rifle, fired three rounds. Two of them hit the people in the car. One of them missed. That's the story, guys. What's, what's to question? And... Actually, what I was surprised at is that the amount of um, agreement between different people that that could agree to that position, not because they had investigated it properly and that was their honest opinion, but because that was the easiest opinion or to go against that opinion was um, going to be detrimental to them in some way. It probably should have been voiced to have independent people involved, not people with military careers, even if they were limited in resources of whatever they could be. I think the HSCA was very limited, but you also had a bunch of people that were 
had more of the patriotic mindset. Um, so they weren't going to look into any, obviously, CIA activities or things of that sort. And that's why Gerald Ford was so keen on trying to censor some of the issues and some of the things of the Rockefeller Commission, because he didn't want those exposed as national security issues. Absolutely right. And I come to a kind of conclusion in the book about a good way of doing this would be, look, just just select some forensic pathologists who are not Americans. <laughs> We've got plenty of them. They, they all speak English in Australia. They speak English in Canada, in India, and over here in the UK. You could get some amazingly competent people who have seen gunshot wounds, and, and they could review the case for you and do it honestly. And they're not likely to be in the pay of Uncle Sam. Why do you think there's so much good evidence and then bad evidence involved in the archives? We have like fake photos of the brain and real photos of the brain or a drawing of the brain, an accurate depiction compared to photographs that could be possibly faked or not Kennedy's brain. Yeah, but I guess there might be two two reasons for that. Um, the first reason might be, well, to keep all of us researchers spinning our wheels because this stuff doesn't match up. You can't. You can't get one piece of evidence to support another. That that keeps us looking and keeps us questioning and keeps us um, doing podcasts and and conferences. That's what's one reason for it. And the other reason might be just be the way it's happened. You know, over the years, and it is sixty years now, that evidence has just come out that way. So you can't you can't unalter the Spruder film. There isn't an original kicking about anywhere. Um, any smoking gun in the Secret Service files was. Um, burnt a long time ago. Um, if the Supruda film is altered, by the way, I'm, I'm not coming down one side or the other on that. I was going to ask you that too. What are your thoughts on I know some people, even if they don't think it's altered, they talk about they don't think Connolly was shot at the same time Kennedy was shot. And I've seen it over and over again. I don't think, because I don't see Connolly react the same time Kennedy reacts, he more reacts to the sound. Like he obviously tries to look behind him and then you really actually see him get hit like a second later when the headshot happens where Connolly starts kind of like lunging forward like that, like something did hit him. Uh, my opinion is you, you can't, if you believe a piece of evidence has been altered in any way, whether it's a, a photograph or a drawing. You or can't a use a film, film that doesn't have sound to try and no, talk well, about how many shots. That's difficult yeah. in the first place. But it, it, and let's just take a photo. Let's take an X-ray, okay? A, an X-ray, which um, some people think the X-rays have been altered in some way. They've been patched to hide something or um, whatever. But you can't use that X-ray, which you believe has been altered, to then prove another point. You can't use an X-ray where you say, "Well, the back of the head has been patched," to prove something about the top of the head. This is a, an altered piece of evidence. So that that just wouldn't be allowed. It wouldn't be allowed in court. That's not evidence. So if you believe the Sapruda film has been altered in any way, you can't then use other parts of the film to to sort of argue something else. Because maybe it's been altered in those areas and you just haven't detected it. I hate to ask what I hate to ask what your theory would be, but what would your theory be about why they took the body to Bethesda? Well, I mean, if I had to come down on one side or the other, I believe they took it to Bethesda so that the autopsy could be controlled. Agreed. I'm trying to figure out how they have a perfectly preserved brain in there when people who took photos of the autopsy talked about that the brain was gray, like it was soaking in formaldehyde for a certain amount of time, longer than Kennedy had been dead, which really makes you question. I mean, everyone sees this in Pruder film, you see the headshot happen. Whether it's you're going to lose matter of your brain. That's just I feel like that's just common sense. But people could disagree if they want about that. But having this brain that looks like there's no damage to it at all makes you kind of wonder. Yeah, I, I am lucky that I have dissected brains, um, whole brains. Um, so I know exactly what those people are talking about. Um, and if the, if anybody says there was a whole brain at the autopsy, then it wasn't JFK's brain. Because I absolutely agree with you that there, there must have been some maths missing, quite a lot of it, I would have thought, missing. And I think um, the overall weight at the ending when they measured it, it was above average. That's um, right. Yeah. yeah. Which doesn't yeah. make sense. Uh, way above average. Um, and if there was mass missing from the brain, it would have been below average, of course.
Do you think they might have used a cadaver's brain? Well, yeah, absolutely. It may have just swapped it over, yeah. Very, very easy to do. I mean, we I did dozens of them. I hate to say it, but do you know the story about the ambulance going missing for like 45 minutes or so, where they couldn't find the ambulance that was carrying uh, JFK's body? Oh, all of this kind of shenanigans that, that um, various people have found, particularly um, Lifton and Horn, about which which ambulance was the body in and which was carrying a empty casket and or maybe an alternative body or you know i mean this it's it's amazing work that they've done and to discover all of this these different arrival times and i don't know and they don't know either all they all they can do is present the evidence and give their opinion or the evidence as they see it yeah. who knows i know this is a uh... I wouldn't say this is a weird question, but do you think we'll ever get an answer, not to the whole Kennedy assassination, but at least to probably more conclusive evidence to support about what exactly unfolded when it came to Kennedy's autopsy? You know, if there is manipulation, the stuff that we can already point out, but just a clear cut answer of like, okay, this was actually like, that's what I would think some of the files would be left, would be some actual direction of what happened, the chain of events following um, the movement of the body to if there was autopsy, uh, pre-autopsy on the head. I just feel like you have to keep that around. I know people say they wouldn't have that written down, but I feel like they would have a, a little bit of instructions of what exactly was going to unfold, whether it was a memo getting sent or something. I, if, if I have to have an opinion, I would say we probably have all the evidence that we're going to have. I, I think anything that was very incriminatory that's a word, uh, or against the government's uh, position has either not existed in the first place or it's been destroyed over the years. And each time people have tried to look at the case or there's been an official investigation, I think more material has disappeared. Or, or it, you know, the guys would have said, hey, you know, this photograph doesn't fit, bin it. Let's, let's get rid of that. I think that's what's happened. And because we don't have any people who are left now who were alive at the time who could give different testimony i don't think we've got anything new that's likely to be forthcoming there either um so i i don't think we're ever going to get to the bottom of it i i think we might get a we might get a strong opinion that maybe someone at some point will come up with a way of knitting together the differences that i see into a coherent story. Nobody's been able to do that yet. Um, you have to, whatever story people come up with at the moment, they have to discount one set of evidence or not. And it's very easy for people to come back and say, yeah, but this shows the opposite of what you're saying. So my honest answer is, I think it's a mystery forever. Do you think the doc, did you see the documentary, what the doctor saw? Yeah, I think I, I think I did, yeah. About the Parkland doctors, Robert McClelland and all these other McClelland, all these others that were involved in this documentary that are no longer here with us. But yeah, I don't, I don't I, know. I, yeah. I did see it. Yeah. Did you think it was important? I mean, if we talked about an investigation being done with kids of my generation that pick up an interest into the assassination, I think you would have a lot more government scrutiny on a lot of aspects of things just on the basis of how history is kind of progressed forward after you know watergate and all these other activities I, I think the thing with talking to the doctors many years later is that their opinions have been colored by various books and films and magazine articles that have come out and they it's a natural thing to do as a human to incorporate some of that into your own recollection and to repeat that as if it's your own rec recollection and of course when you're talking to a tv program you're not under oath for me, the, the best source of evidence are those original um, admission notes, which anybody can read in the autopsy, sorry, in the Warren Commission report. Uh, go to those, have a look at what they said on the day, which they wrote down before anybody had spoken to them, uh, and see what you think compared to what other people have written in uh, from what happened at the autopsy. That, I think that's the best way. Well, Russell, I appreciate you giving me the time to dust off this subject again and be able to talk a little bit more about the medical evidence. I'm still, Welcome. it's still a giant area of confusion for me, um, but we're getting there slowly.
Keep going, Robert. You'll get there. Um, Russell, is there a place where people can find any of your links? Yeah, sure. I, I have a website now. Um, it's, um, do you want me to read it to you? Yeah, uh, go ahead. Okay, so it's HTTPS uh, colon slash slash Russell Kent or one word dot my dot canva dot site. And I'll send it to you, Robbie. Maybe you can of uh, give a link to it. I'll put a link in the description, but is there a time or scheduled date of your book's release um, that will be coming out about the Belson trials? Um, it's it's about the British trials. Um, Belson was one of them. I know. I keep I keep saying it wrong. It's the bees, man. I worked a sixteen hour shift. I'm lucky. I'm sitting up. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a hard it's a hard life for you lead. No, some of those clips you uh, you did were great. Those clips we have on the YouTube shorts they trended really quickly. I was surprised at the number of people that were interested in the Numbrick stuff. Five thousand on one of them. Um, and I didn't notice there's Howard Hughes connections, at least to the point where he crashed an airplane through one of the main uh, prosecutors. Uh, well, houses. yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was interesting. Yeah. Well, it's going to be called the Curio House Trials. Um, it's with the publisher at the moment. It's going through its um, first edit. Um, I have the, the book cover. I've had a look at that. Um, there may be some changes to that. I've, I've just seen the proof of it. So, um, it's coming along. I expect it to be out later this year, but exactly when I don't know. Usually that kind of book comes out in November. So um, watch this space. Yeah, I'll definitely have you back on to talk about it when it gets released. But for anyone interested in looking into the book or looking into a conversation about it, we've done an episode. Uh, it's Russell's second appearance on. The things you don't think about, which is the fact that you have so many people that you have to send to trial and you realize that you have to start cutting these trials in half, basically, and how long it took for the media to just lose interest in the whole subject when they were so interested in the beginning. That's fascinating stuff. Thank you. Yeah, I hope so. But there's more about it on my website. Um, there's links um, to various talks that I've done. I think there's a link to one of your podcasts, if you don't mind. Hey, look at that. Uh, that's great. Um, <laughs> I'm glad. Now we got new thumbnails. They look a little bit more professional. But uh, um, I'm going to link all your links in the description, Russell. Seriously, it's been a pleasure chatting with you again, my friend. And thanks, everybody, for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank. And stay tuned for our next episode.